Hi everybody and welcome to part four of the World Heavyweight Amplifier Series, better known as the SX1980 by Pioneer. So as we saw in our last video, the amplifier is working. It sounds pretty good. Um, all the power supplies are working perfectly. We sorted out all the problems with the power switch and the soft start and all that. And we are now moving on to the restoration of the front end of this receiver, which is going to consist of the flat amplifier, the tone control boards, all of the switches, and the phono stage. So we're going to try to get through all that on this video, and then we'll do another quick test, make sure everything's good. And uh, that should be it for this particular part. So if that sounds interesting to you, stand by and we'll be getting started right away. So I took all the front connectors off here and took all the nuts and screws out and we pulled the first layer of boards which is going to be your tone control and uh, your flat amplifier and I also pulled out the phono stage and just to kind of keep them out of the way while I work on what I'm going to go for next, um, I raided my wife's sewing bench and found first thing I happened upon was some yarn. So it looked perfect for holding these boards out of the way. Don't tell her I took her yarn. And uh, we're all set to go with that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to get these little screws out of the front. And we're going to pull these switchboards out and kind of swing them out. Um, and we're going to try to clean these switches because the, the auxiliary, for instance, selector switch was so bad it actually made the amplifier sound like it had a bad channel when really there was nothing wrong with it. It was just so much corrosion and tarnish on the contacts. And I know I've gone over this in previous videos how to clean these, but I'll run over it one more time briefly when I get these apart. I'll do one with you on camera. Well, it's our favorite time of the restoration process, and that is known as switch cleaning time. <laughs> I hate switch cleaning time. Anyway, let's start out with a few of the tools that we're going to need to do this job. The first thing you need to have that, well, you don't need to have, but is a lot more helpful if you do have, is these little, they look like little needle tips. Now they're not pointed, they're not sharp, they're, they're blunt, they're cut off flush. See there? And they come in a lot of different sizes, as you can see. And the way you purchase them is you can go on all the normal haunts like eBay or, you know, Banggood or all those other ones. And you can get these little bottles, they're little applicator bottles. And you get the little squeeze bottle, and then you get an assortment of different size tips. And I just bought a couple of them. I just keep them in a little container. And what you're going to do with it is, you don't really need the bottle for this. But what I do is I take some heat shrink, and you can see my deoxit. And I heat shrink one of those little needle applicators to the end of it. And that kind of seals it up so it just sprays out that tip. And you want to use a relatively, not a, not a teeny one, but just maybe about a one millimeter, give or take. The other thing you're going to need is called a pin vise. A pin vise is just a little handle with a chuck on the end of it that can hold little tiny drill bits. And you're just going to get a small drill bit that's about the size of your needle tip. And what we're going to do is, if you look at all of these switches, most manufacturers, and I'll zoom in a little bit, you'll notice that you have these little slots in here. So you see the slot? And those slots go all the way down inside the switch. We don't want to disassemble this because there are a lot of tiny little contacts that will come apart. And they're very, very flimsy plastic. You really don't want to disrupt these unless you have to, and they're pretty sealed up, so it's kind of hard to clean them properly inside. Now you can, if you unsoldered all of them, you could probably soak them in something, 
but that's not fun to do either being that there's so many connectors to you know to desolder so what I do is I go into these little slots here and I enlarge the center one I'll find one that's near the center and I'll enlarge it with this little drill bit now here's the thing as we're doing this I'll try to do it on camera and I'm not going to do as neat of a job as I normally do because I'm literally reaching around a camera and looking at the viewfinder but you see that stuff that comes out you want to wipe that off don't let it push down inside the switch and the spiral bit will actually pull outward on it as you're as you're turning it let's see if I can get a shot of it just like that when you feel it grip pull out and get the plastic out just like that and there you go that one's poked through now don't go way down in you just you just wanted to get enough through that little that you get through the little fiber area up there see how thin that is that's all the further you have to go down and on the other side here this is two sets of contacts you know two rows of them so we're going to do this side I'm going to try to let you see it and once again if you can do it with it facing down it's even better because you can let gravity pull those little pieces out just like that you have to be careful but you can do this if you're careful and you can see right there we poke through now the next thing you're going to do is just get your applicator put it inside there and just and you can see it even squirts out clear at the end now I hold one switch down because this is one of those you know if it it pushes out and you just work it back and forth a whole bunch of times just like that and I know it's getting blurry but And that's going to clean that switch, and that deoxid is actually going to lubricate the mechanisms in that switch, and it will stay clean for a very long time with that deoxid in there. That's good stuff. That'll coat those contacts and clean them. And there you go. So these two are done. I'm going to finish these last three with the same process, but that's really all there is to it. Again, if you, I mean, you can take these whole assemblies off, but there's a whole bunch of pins you have to desolder. Uh, sometimes they have little plastic sliders that the, that the contacts connect to, and if you overheat them trying to desolder them, you can actually melt that plastic, and then the switches will stick. This is a, the least invasive way of doing this. You can also take these little clips off, and they hold along with these clips but then you have to remove this front portion believe it or not and you can take the wafer off but what can happen is these little tiny horseshoe contacts can fall out and they're very difficult to get back in so this method at least for me I've been doing this for years I've never had a problem using this technique you just have to be careful that you number one that you don't accidentally poke the drill bit into the contacts and ruin them and number two that you keep pulling out the uh, the little chips as you're drilling down inside as long as you do that it'll be fine and the thing I like the most is you notice all of the spray stayed inside the switch where it belongs and didn't get all over the board and mess up the board so let me finish these up and then uh, we'll go on to our next step So we're going to pause here for a second, and we are going to talk about a couple things here on this board. Uh, if you notice on this board, there are some transistors. And of the transistors that are on this board, two of them have these little blue paint dots on them. And I know I've mentioned this multiple times on other restoration videos, but what those are is those are bin marks. Um, what, what these are is typically what they used to do is they would get 
a bin of transistors, um, all the same type, and they will test them for beta. Okay, so they'll do a specific test, they'll put them on a curve tracer, and they will basically sort them by their range of, of gain. And then they'll put a little dot on, you know, the, a colored dot that represents each gain range. So there may be a yellow dot, a blue dot, and a green dot. And each one is going to be a different range of gains. Similar to, if you ever look on, when you're on mauser.com or something, you when you look at a certain type of transistor, like a KSC1845 or something, they always have a letter after them and could have several letters. And one of those letters actually tells you the gain range of that transistor. But back when they made these, they didn't always do that. So it's important when you replace these not to just look at the part number of the transistor, but also to make sure you have you know what gain it is. Now that might be difficult if a transistor is damaged. But in this case, these ones are working, so we can actually test them and get an idea of uh, what they are so we know which ones to replace them with. Uh, to add a little more complexity to this situation, if you look at this transistor, and I'll see if I can get some better light on the subject here without dropping things. If you look, this transistor down here is a KSA 726 and unlike the transistors on the amplifier modules uh, which had very reliable transistors these KSA 726's are known to have issues with as they age they'll get noisy so after a while these will eventually get to a point where they'll you'll start to hear like a, a static or a popping sound in the background. It'll be very random and it'll be very hard to troubleshoot. And it may also give you like a hissing noise, you know, where you'll hear like hiss in the background. And it's the transistor. It's a noisy transistor. So these really should be replaced um, because of their known problems. But on top of that, what we're going to do is we're going to test them to see what kind of gain value. Now, sometimes you can find a chart that will say if it has a blue dot, it'll have a gain anywhere from 200 to 400, or it'll have a gain value of anywhere between 120 and 250, something like that. In this instance, I don't have that information, and the color does not necessarily always mean the same thing. It's based upon whoever did the testing and the binning of these that they you know what they used what color code they used for what value so you can't just go if this one turns out to be one value you can't just say every amp you ever uh, do in the future you ever restore if you see the blue dot it always means that gain value because that's not true but what that also means is that that was a critical thing for this part of the circuit in other words they specifically wanted a transistor with that gain value for whatever reason in that position. So you can't just willy-nilly replace it with any old transistor, even a, a direct replacement, without also knowing the gain value. And then you, your replacement, you want to get one that matches that. So that's what we're going to do, and then we will get them replaced. All right, we have one of these 2SA726s just in the little cheapy uh, transistor tester. And if you see, it's a PNP transistor. And its current gain is 436. And what you're going to find out is both of those transistors, I pulled them out, they're both in the 400s. So that blue dot pretty much means that that's, they're binned at about a, a gain of somewhere, an HFE of somewhere around 400. Now just to kind of give you an example, if you just Google search things, which I'm not a big Google searcher, I, I use it as a baseline, but you're better off doing your research rather than just going to a forum and listening to what somebody wrote on there. And this is one of the reasons why. 
if you go out there they'll just tell you to replace it with something like a KSA 992 for instance uh, which actually can be a really suitable replacement and is probably what I'm going to use however there's more to the story than that let's move over here and if we go to the curve tracer and we look and we look at the curves on this and yes we can do the math and you'll see that it comes out somewhere in the 400s about 430 or 440 somewhere around there and if we and if you notice I have it mounted on this side if I go to this side I have a KSA 992 that I pulled and if I switch to that one you can see that it has considerably less gain and if we actually put it on dual channel to compare I don't know if the camera's picking that up but this one here is the 992 and this one here is the KSA 726 and you can see there is a big difference in the gain curves on this thing so what's more if you look at the pinout the pins are swapped on a KSA 992 which is another thing you have to really be aware of so if we put if we do use one of these it has to be a gain of 400 in that 400 range and you have to put it in backwards so if the transistor was facing this way on the circuit board with this one that transistor is going to have to face this way on this one just some things to be aware of you can't just go online and read something really quick and follow it I know a lot of people get down on me it's like you talk too much and, and I just want to know how to fix it what do I replace well fools rush in <laughs> where wise men fear to tread uh, so I'm just saying do your research and it could save you a lot of hassle down the road so we're going to do that and when we find our correct replacement we'll be back so here's what we've come up with let's take a look at our original KSA 992 and if we look very closely if I can find a flashlight this is a KSA 992 FCE and this one is a KSA 992 FCF okay so this is an E series gain this is an F series gain now back to our original that's this one here and you can see where the gain is and if we look at the other one you can see the difference and if we compare them you can see very different characteristics again this quite often does not matter any KSA 992 in this in a circuit will work as long as that circuit is not heavily dependent upon the forward current gain or the HFE of that transistor again pioneer would not have put those blue dots and those special binned transistors in there unless it was necessary for that so let's pull this transistor out now that we compared them here and let's just put it on our little tester again and see what it looks like compared to that 726 that we pulled out and we test it and it says a PNP transistor and you can see the gain is 461 so it's up in the 400 it's actually a little bit higher than the 726 is but that's fine they're in the 400 range and that's good so we have a good match and I pulled two of them out of stock and that's what we're going to replace get those mounted up in there and we'll be good for another 30 years in there well we got this one done and uh, this is the tone control board and it's all recapped and we had four transistors and again they were the snap crackle pop kind of transistors that go bad again um, this is a different one these are the 2SC 1312s if you see those which I just dropped on the floor if you see any of those in there uh, you might want to consider just replacing them even if they're good because these ones tend to get uh, 
when they warm up, they'll, they're the ones that'll kind of give you those little snap noises, you know, pop intermittently, and it'll drive you insane trying to find them. So uh, swap them out, and uh, you can replace them with a KSC 1845. They work just fine. Um, they are very high gain, and they're very low noise, so just keep that in mind when you uh, pick out your transistors. But the 1845s work really good in replacement for them. All right, I'm going to put this back together, and then we're going to move up to this last board here. And I know you're probably some of you may ask, so I'll try to answer it ahead of time. I should have mentioned it. Um, the capacitors I used in here, these ones, they're Nichicon and they're KL series, which are a very low noise type capacitor. They're actually used in uh, situations where, like switch mode power supplies and things that need low noise components and they're pretty closely matched as far as specs to those old Elna orange capacitors so they work really well in here we're gonna try those out and uh, I think they'll be a perfect match they're actually supposedly a little better uh, matched up to those than even the Nichicon gold series although I, d I doubt that you would be able to hear any difference in either one the main thing is that you have a low noise capacitor in there um, and that's what we did. Okay, that's it. Well, let's take the 30,000 foot view. I'll stand on the other side of the building here so we can get this in <laughs> all in frame. But I have the amplifier for the most part reassembled. Um, all of this has been recapped and done. The only two things at this point in time that haven't been done is the tuner and the phono stage and the reason we haven't done the phono stage is we're going to take some preliminary measurements before we uh, replace anything on it because I want to see where we're at now and I want to kind of compare it. Um, so I'm going to put the bottom on and this bottom was a real hassle to fix. Whatever leaked inside this amplifier all laid on this bottom cover and it was a huge mess. So I ended up having to take it down to the shop, put one of those cup brushes on a wire uh, or on an angle grinder, and I had to take it all down to bare metal and the pitting and all. And then I had to use some filler primer and then paint it. And it didn't come out 100% perfect, but really if you look at it, it looks pretty good. The outside portion that you see turned out even better so I think it'll be just fine there were no holes in it thank goodness so uh, that's good but anyway I didn't think I'd be getting into doing body work I thought this was going to be an electronics video but <laughs> oh well a couple of things I want to share with you guys I got some awesome comments on the last video and they, I have to share them with with everyone number one when we remember these pins here on this on these connectors and how tarnished they were and I was using that little scratch brush which works pretty well uh, I had two different viewers give me the tip that you can take an eraser kinda like one of these ones drill a hole the diameter of the pin drop a little bit of deoxit down in there and then run it down over the pin and rotate it and it cleans it perfectly. I think that is a fantastic idea. And I am so glad that they shared that with me. So number two, I got a couple of tips about this board here also. Um, since I posted the video, I guess there's been a little bit of discussion on Audio Karma uh, with the designer of this board. And he actually found out, or at least let us know, um, that there are four different versions of this and I knew there were different versions of all of the Pioneer receivers like this because there's ones that are that have uh, switchable mains transformers that are different um, there were ones that were made strictly for the United States some that were made for military import into the United States and some of them that were made for the European market and they're slightly different they're the same receiver with the exception of the power section so that whole pin one and two thing can be different depending on what model you have so that's really important information uh, 
the other thing I want to say is that after testing this thing, I have to say that this is almost a must if you are going to restore one of these receivers. And I understand all the arguments about keeping things original, but honestly, if you want it to be a shelf queen, I think it's fine to, to fix the original board and use it, and it'll work just fine. But if this is going to be something you're going to put on your stereo rack and listen to on a regular basis, this is going to ensure that as long as you're going to own it, it's going to work. Uh, it runs so much cooler than the original design. The voltages are rock solid. Um, all of the little minor issues that the original board had are corrected by this board. And if, uh, if you get this particular board, the same one that I got, you can make that little modification to the power switch wire over here like we did in the last video. But I do believe that there will be a new version of this. If I understood correctly, come on to the comments and let me know. But there will be another version of this board that will be able to accommodate the uh, pins 1 and 2 uh, for the power switching issue. So that's great news. But I just can't imagine somebody spending so much time designing such a thing for such a limited product. Um, and it just goes to show how dedicated people can be to this hobby. So that's just completely awesome. I am very thankful when people do this with this board um, and also with, uh, with Hop Chris Hoppy and his... Uh, boards that he's doing for the ADCOM. I mean, these are going to ensure that these classic pieces of equipment will stay around for many, many years to come, and they'll be a piece of history one day. They already are, but, you know, someday somebody's going to look back and say, what did it really sound like to play a record? You know, what what did it sound like? And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to preserve this equipment so that someday will be able to look back and, and listen to these classic pieces of equipment. So anyway, enough about that. Let's put the bottom cover on this, flip it around. We're going to do some tests on the amp and see how it works. And then we're going to come back to this phono stage. All right, really good news. My nuts came in um, and, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I, uh, maybe I'll edit that or maybe I won't I don't know the nylon nuts arrived that I ordered for these studs of these capacitors and they look pretty good um, I might just leave them as they are or I might paint them that's one option uh, the other option is over here and what I did was I made a little plastic cap it looks like this. It's made out of this really high-end plastic. And it actually looks pretty good. I don't know. I'm kind of tossed up. I don't know which one I want. This just goes on like this. And then there's some set screws that I'm going to just put in that you just tighten it on to the stud and it's ready to go. I don't know which looks better. So I'm going to do a poll. You guys tell me what looks better. The cap nuts or the cap, the uh, oval cap? Let me know in the comments down below. So anyway, we're going to test this thing out. And uh, I'm doing some work on the face plate yet. It's not quite done or I would have it on right now. But uh, we're still working on that. But I think we're at a point now where we can test this thing out. Well, hopefully I have this whole thing in shot. Um, we have our power meters here and 270 watts, in case it's a little bit blurry, is the second to the last notch here. So right there, that would be 0 dB. And you can see the oscilloscope. Again, don't pay attention to that those little fringes floating around on the uh, trace. This scope has a low sample rate. It's noisy. It is a very inexpensive USB uh, oscilloscope. So don't expect miracles out of it. We're just, we really just care about seeing the waveform right now, kind of seeing when it starts to flat top at, uh, you know, clipping. And 
I had to put this thing on the uh, uh, minus 20 dB for the volume because the steps of the volume were too <clears throat> too radical to be able to get it to just to clipping. And I have my 300 load dummy 300 ohm dummy load connected, which is say that three times fast, and that's about the limit of what that load can handle. <laughs> and we're going to see it's going to just start clipping right at that 270. So 46 volts RMS is about 265 watts, roughly. So, and I don't think you could see the numbers from the angle you're at, but here we go. We're going to take it all the way up to clipping. And you can see right about there's clipping, there's off clipping. And you can see we're right at 270 watts. And I'm not going to run it forever like that. But, uh, that I was getting about 46 volts RMS on each channel, which is right around 265, 270 watts range. So the meters don't even need calibrated. Um, the amplifier is working perfectly, and I really haven't done the fine tuning for the bias and offset yet. Usually I like to run the amp a little while, let it warm up, uh, kind of let it idle. It may be, in this case, I'd idle this one maybe. 50 watts per channel for a while and then back it back down and recheck bias um, really that's all I just did a preliminary run through on that for now and you can see how well it's working right out of the box so I checked all the functions just quickly the tone controls and the switches they're all working perfectly really this thing is is working great the tuner does tune but it's going to need some work it's going to need some alignment done on it i haven't done the recapping on it and i probably will do the re i will probably recap this tuner um, the capacitors i think are in pretty decent shape on them but just because the rest of the the receiver was done i think it's appropriate that i do it as well which will probably throw out the alignment a little bit, so we'll have to do it anyway. But uh, we are making extremely good progress. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a couple of baseline tests for our phono stage. Again, I believe the phono stage in these classic devices, I just hit the camera, is really important because really from a historical standpoint, 30 years from now, I, you, know, you never know where we're going to be with vinyl. Um, hopefully it'll still be around because it's a it's a me recording medium that I kind of like um, but regardless just for historical purposes it'd just be really cool all these years from now to be able to still connect a turntable to something like this and hear what it really sounded like um, I just think that's that's a cool thing so anyway enough talk about that let's get some more test equipment connected up and see what we got